So here we have our little rumor monger, Tux, who's going to help us out with some rumors that we're going to explore later. But first, we're going to start off with the basics, basic facts. U-Boot was born in the year 2000 had a couple of parents called FADROM and 8XXROM. Those are both bootloaders for PowerPC. It was an old type of PowerPC um, by Motorola, and it was for embedded stuff, not for Macintoshes. There were some of uh, these PowerQuick chips, and uh, Linux was uh, one of the things that, that ran really well on them. Back then, because it was uh, so dedicated to, to power PCs in its initial introduction, they used to be called PPC boots. But nowadays, it's called DOS U boot for its full formal name. That almost nobody uses, but that is what it's called. So let's take a look at what U boot actually does. And I'm going to compare it to the, the PC scenario, since if you're not yet familiar with U-Boot, that's probably uh, something that you're, you're least familiar with. So let's look at the PC boot. To start with the hardware, you have your main storage, normally a hard drive. But inside the PC, you've got this flash thing that your BIOS or your EFI lives on. And of course, you have your, your main memory, your RAM. So when you start the boot, you have this BIOS in old days, UEFI in modern days, that is the, the first thing that runs when you hit your power. The next thing that runs is the GRUB, say. That's pretty common for your uh, Linux based PC, although there are a few other alternatives that you could be using. Let's go for the normal choice. The BIOS or UF, UEFI swoops up the grub off of your hard drive and pops it into the RAM where it starts running. And the next step is that your bootloader goes back to the main storage and swoops up the kernel and starts running that out of RAM. So we've got something analogous happening on our embedded board, but not quite exactly the same. To begin with, the main storage is, can be a hard drive, but it rarely is. It's more normal to have even the, the single chip type, uh, the, uh, the raw type storages in old days, say back in the PPC boot days. We had the luxury of NOR chips, which are very reliable. Nowadays, you might have a NAND, you might have uh, an SD card, or it might be on an EMMC, which is kind of like a, an SD card that's been soldered to your board. And in place of a whole chip to run your, your BIOS, you have the, the, C, the SOC, System on Chip CPUs, that have ROM inside the chip from the manufacturer. And that's going to be the, the, uh, the early boot. Plus, they normally have some SRAM, static RAM, also inside the CPU. So static RAM is pretty expensive. So this is just a teeny little blob of, of static RAM to, to get yourself bootstrapped and running. And then you, you normally, for an embedded system that's big enough to run Linux, you normally have the separate DDR memory for your um, RAM. So the, the first thing that happens when you hit the power on your embedded board is it goes into this boot ROM, which is inside the, the CPU. Uh, because this is so tightly coupled to the CPU, it's like the old PC BIOS, where every vendor does their own thing with their little boot ROM. So the specifics of, of how these work is you're going to have to get familiar with the, the uh, data sheets for your parts. There are some things that are in common, but details are, are always, uh, you got to go with your, your vendor specifics. 
So somehow the boot ROM goes out to your main storage, and it goes out and loads this SPL, which stands for Secondary Program Loader, because the boot ROM, boot ROM is considered to be the first. So SPL, once upon a time, used to be a separate uh, project, a separ separate software project. Um, the goal here is to be really, really tiny, so tiny that you fit into whatever the, the CPU designer deigned to give you for that internal SRAM memory. So we're, we're talking like just a few kilobytes. Um, in modern times, U-Boot has actually learned how to, to uh, pack itself into tight spaces, shall we say, and U-Boot can actually build, do a, an, a special SPL build that goes tiny, tiny and fits inside the CPU. So the whole purpose in life of this SPL is to then go out and drag your U-Boot in from wherever it's living to give yourself a proper full-service bootloader. Um, you get that loaded into the, to the main memory and jump in and let it do its thing. So the embedded boot is actually tends to be a little more complicated than the, the old PC. You get you have to know your hardware a little more to if you're you know doing a board support package. So then the U boot is the thing that's equivalent it's really equivalent to the, the grub job where it goes and pulls the kernel out of your storage and pops it in a RAM and, and runs it. But it turns out that U-Boot actually does a lot more. It is a, a little more diverse in its talents than Grub or whatever your PC, your favorite bootloader is. So let's take a look at some of these things that U-Boot uh, knows how to do. So, of course, to qualify as being a bootloader, has to know how to load and boot images. That's pretty much a given. But it also is a lot more skilled in initializing and exercising hardware than your typical you know, desktop or server BIOS because uh, people tend to use U-Boot more than just the uh, end user final bootloader. But from the time the your custom board is, is born, you know, just the very first versions back from the factory, a lot of times people are using U-Boot to exercise whatever um, the hardware guys changed from the, the reference design and make sure it actually works. So instead of the classical um, menu system that you have in a, bio, in a BIOS, you have the just a command line interface to U-Boot. But the good news is that uh, you have a lot of flexibility in uh, managing the environment variables so that you can have a, a stateful system and save all kinds of settings, any kinds of settings that you need to know in order to boot your system. And the final one that makes it really fun is that U-Boot can actually run scripts. Um, when you're sitting at the command line, it has a command line parser, which if you, if you want to configure it, actually can do a command line history, you know, like a shell. It has conditionals and, you know, if this, then that. It, it's actually pretty good. So suppose you had a you know, the, it, it gives you a lot more flexibility than, say, just the BIOS menus, where you, a lot of times the, the vendor may not have given you the, the commands that you really wanted to be able to do. Like, say, you have just some desktop system, and you wanted to remember to always power on after the, uh, the power goes off, right? That's a server thing. Well, if you've got a desktop BIOS, you might not have bothered to put that in. 
with you, Boots, uh, pretty much you, you've got a, just a ton of flexibility between the, the generic environment mechanism and running scripts based on your environment settings. Because you can actually um, have a collaborative thing going where when Linux is running, it decides that the next boot is going to be a special one. Say you're going to do an upgrade. And so you just set a variable and the, the script that you gave the, the U-boot lets it know that you want to do something special that only happens on upgrades. So it's pretty cool. For so now we'll get in, after we've done the basics, we'll get into some of these rumors that were in the abstract. I've got my little helper, the, uh, the Tux, who's into rumors, I managed to dig up these leads we're going to investigate to see how many of them are actually true. First one, he claims, he heard claims that U-Boot is a network strike breaker for a small fee. He heard that U-Boot likes to go around flashing bare NANDs without a permit. He heard that U-Boot has been known to reprogram uncooperative boards for Jenkins. And the last zany one that he didn't actually manage to fit into the abstract is that U-Boot was heard to perform alchemical transformations. So, starting from the top. So, let's, let's talk about the normal case first. Under normal circumstances, U-Boot likes to team up with Ethernet to get pixie-like booting going. So for those who don't know what pixie-like booting is, um, the, in some of those BIOSes for servers and so forth, you had a, a PXE uh, mechanism for doing net booting. So you could have a whole cluster of, uh, of diskless things that would boot off of the, that would know how to boot off, boot off their Ethernets and then say either run out of a RAM disk or do an NFS mount. So you can do something similar with U-Boot. Um, you need some prep work unlike the real PXE. In the real PXE you have a special uh, flavor of a DHCP server that not only tells the the client what their IP addresses is, but it also tells them where to go to uh, find their boot images on the network, tells them the, the server IP and stuff. So with this mere pixie-like booting, you have to go into the ENV and set up a server IP ahead of time and uh, give it the, the boot art so that it's going to know to net boot. Then you use a couple of commands. You use DHCP to get it its own IP address, and you use TFTP boot to grab the actual bootable image off the network. Okay, so that's great. They're usually on good terms, Ethernet and U-Boot. So what happens when the Ethernet devices go on strike? Say you have to pick a, a completely random example that may never have happened. Well, yes, it did. Okay, flaky early board spins. You find out uh, that that first version that comes back from the, the uh, factory that you cannot get to its Ethernet. And you're trying to do your, your rapid iterations with your development where you keep on building new kernels and booting the NFS. Um, that won't, that won't cut it if your Ethernet phi got glitched in the first version. So there's another case at the opposite end of the spectrum. Sometimes uh, these uh, penny-pinching hardware people end up taking off the Ethernet. So the final production hardware does not have an Ethernet. Um, I may have seen this as well. <laughs> So what happens when the local network is on strike? U-Boot just teams up with the serial instead. 
to use the command load x, load y, load z, and it's really old school because those things are x modem, y modem, and Kermit, like back in the modem days. Uh, you can use programs like Minicom is my favorite. Other people use other terminal emulators that still remember how to do these ancient protocols. Okay, so on the other hand, there are no fees involved. Uboot does work for free. So we're going to call this one a partial truth. It does, it does not go with the, the net, it does not uh, cooperate with network strikes, but it doesn't charge a fee. Okay, next rumor. Suppose the, the theory is that U-Boot goes around flashing bear NANDs without a permit. So for those of you who have never attempted to do it yet, uh, raw NAND chip can be a major pain to program. Pain! <laughs> you have to cope with bad block tracking. You know those lovely SSDs that uh, make your desktops and servers so fast nowadays? Uh, they have all kinds of firmware inside them to do the bad block tracking for those stupid little NAND chips inside them that are very, very flaky. Um, in that it's not a question of if there will be bad blocks, it's just where will you have bad blocks. Like, you know, if you have monitors and they won't take it back if you have like, you know, a hundred bad pixels. Oh, it's only a hundred. NAND, the, the NAND manufacturers, they guarantee you that the very first one is good, and beyond that, who knows? Yeah, yeah. So not only do you have to keep track of bad blocks, as if you, with, without having the benefit of your fancy dancy SSD firmware to do it, you also have to do cope with the ECC algorithms and the layout of the ECC bytes. So probably you've, you've heard about uh, ECCs in reference to uh, CDs and DVDs, perhaps. You know, they have the error corrections uh, built in so that every little, every little scratch on your CD or DVD won't ruin the whole thing. It's a, it's a way of, uh, it's a mathematical method for making use of redundancy so that, okay, I know this, I know that there's an error here, and not only that, there's enough redundancy that I can actually figure out what this was supposed to be, even though we've lost some, some bits. In the, in the case of NAND, it's, it's bits that like to get flipped. Um, and again, NAND is so bad that it's not going to be, it's not unlikely that you have more than one bit flipped nowadays. In the earliest NANDs, they used something called a Hamming code, and that was able to detect and correct one bit per block. Now you have to cope with some NANDs are rated for up to eight bit flips per block. So back in the old days when you had NORs, you could, once you learned what the programming uh, protocol was for a particular vendor, you could pretty much just say, okay, here's the image, I'm going to throw on these exact bits and I'll verify it in the end and if the bits match, we're good to go. And so you have to, these little devices called flash programmers, right? So nowadays, the, with the NAND, you need to know exactly which ECC algorithm is the software is going to use because if you put in the, the redund redundancy using a different algorithm, the software is going to think all the blocks are bad. <laughs> not going to be able to read anything. So you have to have exact agreement in calculating these, you know, fancy dancy checksums, and then you have to put them in exactly the right place because you have this OOB part um, out of band area in your NAND, and the layout, you know, say you use bits um, bytes 0 for, through 52, 
and the programmer put them in, you know, shoved them at the end of the, the block and said, you're also going to take all the bad blocks. Okay, so that shows you why if you're getting small quantities of boards from a board house in, in early runs, you're not likely to hear them voluntary. Oh, yes, let me program your NAND for you. No. They're likely to come out bare, blank. Oh, yeah, it was, sometimes it's even worse than just knowing which ECC. Sometimes it's knowing which two ECCs because the, uh, the boot ROM insists on using one ECC and your kernel insists on using another. That's really a pill. Did I say it was a pain? <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. You actually run into this problem. Too many blank NAND chips. So, it turns out that U-Boot does help you out in this situation. There's actually two different uh, general approaches. One is that U-Boot teams up with your boot ROM as a partner, you set your CPU boot jumpers for whatever your boot ROM knows how to do, and you have actual hardware wired up to, to talk to it. Like, for instance, if you've got a board that has an SD card, a lot of the embedded CPUs know how to load a block off the CD, uh, sorry, SD. Or you might have one that knows how to shove things in over serial port using X modem, say, more of that old, old school stuff. You might have USB. You might have an Ethernet boot actually programmed into your tiny little boot ROM. You have to read the docs to know. Sometimes setting the boot jumpers is not as trivial, trivial as you might wish, say, your hardware guy didn't uh, think to, to put the uh, jumpers on for the mode that's actually practical. You might need your soldering iron. So once you have it all set up, you got the plan going, the boot ROM then loads your tiny little SPL. The SPL loads the U-boot just like we had in the earlier diagram. Then the U-boot is smart enough um, once it loads the image to RAM, it will know how to write to NAND in the proper manner. In fact, U-Boot knows how to generally, if you've got a platform where they um, annoyingly make use of more than one ECC, it'll have a command that lets you switch back and forth. You say, okay, I have just loaded my bootloader image, which is basically another copy of U-Boot itself. Now I'm going to burn it with the special bootloader ECC, and now I'm going to load the kernel, and now I'm going to switch over to programming the NAND with the other ECC. So U-Boot can also team up with the JTAG programmer, assuming you've got a nice little JTAG port on your board, which usually they, which hopefully somebody thought of if this is an early revision of the board. Usually the hardware guys are going to want to use the JTAG too, so they do remember that. <laughs> so the JTAG then is able to set up the, uh, the SPL and stuff it into SRAM. You, it will, you can put a breakpoint so that after the SPL has done its usual dirty work of setting up your main RAM so that it actually can uh, remember things. Then it, you can hold it and let the JTAG go again. This time you load the U-boot into your woken up RAM and you run it and then everything works like before. So the, if you've got a JTAG port uh, available and you have one of those JTAG programmers, this is actually a pretty convenient method during early development because the one thing the JTAG programmers usually run faster than say UART <laughs> and you don't have to worry about some wacky custom protocol like you do with the USB sometimes. So 
We're going to say this is truth. It does flash bare lands without a permit. There is no permit. But if there was one, you might actually get it. So, moving right along to our next rumor, we heard that it reprograms uncooperative boards for a guy called Jenkins. You've probably heard of him in other contexts because Jenkins is one of those popular uh, continuous integration or CI frameworks that people use a lot on, on servers, including uh, just all software projects not necessarily embedded. When it comes to doing embedded projects, though, Jenkins sometimes sells for native server tests. Say you've got an application that's, that's pretty generic and just happens to be running on an embedded board. Why not just test it on the server? Sometimes Jenkins sells for QEMU tests. For instance, uh, the uh, open embedded, um, you might have builds where, where it's pretty convenient to go ahead and run, run stuff in the, the QEMU platform. And that would allow you to test that not only does, it, does the application work as designed, does it work on the actual ARM architecture without having some stupid compiler bug getting in your way. But sometimes there's just no way to get around needing to run on the real hardware because QEMU simulates you know, common ARM architecture stuff. It doesn't simulate your, your custom, say you've got hardware inside the, the SOC that, that does, uh, to take a random case, video encoding or video decoding accelerators. QAMU knows nothing about that. So you can't test your applications that are making use of those accelerators. So when it comes to that, and you want your automated test without somebody sitting there and programming the latest, greatest version into your board, you is willing to, to step up to the plate and help out. This is kind of the, uh, the overall strategy. Jenkins will, when it's running one of these hardware-specific tests, will leave a U-boot command script over in a TFTP area because U-boot knows how to do TFTP. Then Jenkins will reboot your board using whatever mechanism you get it, like you might have a uh, software-controlled power switch for the brute force mechanism, or you might have uh, SSH logins where Jenkins is able to reboot the thing. And then U-boot comes up, and U-boot has been told ahead of time that it's supposed to go TFTP that script that Jenkins made it, and just do what it says. So this one is also truth, mostly, because uncooperative boards usually have the option to uh, to opt out. If you've got a really uncooperative board, you usually need to bring back that soldering iron to talk some sense into it. Okay, here we go. This is the zaniest one of all. Does U-boot perform alchemical transformations? Are we talking like lead to gold? No, more like brick to board. <laughs> so this one has actually a number of variants. This is a nice meaty rumor we've got here. The thing they all have in common is that the brick starts out with the serial console because U-boot commands are run over the serial console. The first one is that you have a brick with a USB port in it and then you plug in your USB stick and manage to 
to get your brick back into a board. Or it could be you have a brick with an Ethernet port in it. You plug it into your development laptop and you manage to turn it back into a board. Or maybe you have a brick with a JTAG pins on it and you plug in your JTAG programmer and turn it back into a board. There's a hint for you. Real bricks don't have serial consoles. So, that's the trick. It is not really an alchemical transformation. It really was a board all along, but U-Boot can help you get the board to stop acting like a brick because it is really versatile and it'll pretty work with pretty much whatever you whatever peripherals you've got. If you want a net boot, that's great. If you want to um, shove things in via JTAG and then reflash your board, that's great. We already talked about that. If you want to boot from an SD, you want to boot from a SATA, you basically However you, you want to get your recovery images in, U-Boot can pretty much handle it. But sadly, it was a myth since it wasn't really a brick. So I'm going to do some final conclusions, and then I'm going to do some Q&A time. And uh, other people who like to work with U-Boot are free to share their own war stories and the cool cool U-boot tricks. So first of all, I argue that many books could be written about the exciting life of DOS U-boot. This barely scratched the surface of what U-boot is capable of. But unfortunately, they probably won't get written. Too few of us embedded devs really are, are inclined to write much. So... Those who want more info on U-Boot might have to sell for some presentations. If you go to either of these lists, you will find uh, a few different presentations from the ELC Europe, and it's both slides and videos on YouTube. Or you might try the U-Boot README, which is really, really long, probably one of the longest Readmes you've ever seen and worthy of some light bedtime reading. I mean, it's probably 70 pages printed out. All right, we're going to roll the credits now. Thanks to Dan Malik for the fad ROM back in the day, and Magnus Dam for 8XX ROM. Wolfgang Dank was the one who did PPC boot, which then got renamed to DOS U-Boot because it no longer specialized. Tom Rennie is the current lead maintainer, and they have many friends helping them. I give credit to John Miller, who was the guy who built the uh, Motorola board that ran PPC Boot back in the day, and uh, he was the one who recruited me to help get it on there. So that's how come I'm familiar with U-Boot even now. And credit goes to Tom King for starting a scale embedded track um, starting last year, actually. Pretty happy with that. And my beloved other half gets credit for helping me come up with a topic when the deadline was looming. And Inkscape deserves credit for this whole presentation with all the, the cutesy animations and stuff. It makes writing a presentation fun. And Open Clip Art has graciously provided the traditional Yamas, no wait, the credit Yamas, yes, and the smelly chief that the trainers of the Yamas use to get them to stroll in the right direction, and the brightly colored balloons, and a space shuttle, and finally, 
the horde of friendly penguins that want questions on U-Books. We'll try to answer any questions you've got. I have a really hard question. <laughs> I have a really hard question. I know there are a million versions of U-Boot on the Internet right now. Yes. And I recently did some stuff using a, a ARM chip with a signed boot. Mm-hmm. Ooh, and that's a fun one. Yeah, it is. That's an all-winner chip because you can find the code on the Internet if you look. All-winner is not known for being great at mainstreaming. Whereas if it's Qualcomm or TI, you have to sign NDAs and you go to prison if you talk to anybody. <laughs> what, what advice can you give? Which U-boot is the boot to build to? Like when I do the next project, mm -hmm. do I use Denx's version of it? Do I use one of the, the uh, GitHub versions? What do you think? I would go to the, the U-boot site and actually probably use one of their architecture specific trees. Um, the Tom is the one who maintains the like the equivalent of the Linus tree that has all the architectures merged together. But uh, he has the equivalent of lieutenants that are looking after different uh, architectures, different uh, you know, like the, there's a TI tree there's a TI tree if I were gonna do TI um, and there's quite a few of them. I forget if there was an all-winner one. You might go with the, 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 the main. Oh, I have the all-winner one. Yeah, but, but is, Stolen it, is, from it from you, is it from U-Boot or from the vendor? Uh, it's from the vendor. It ended up on the Internet, so yeah. I can See, say that, that I have it. That's what I mean. These, this, is a step of, this is a step better than that in that they're actually, the change is coming from these trees that are listed as basically uh, lieutenants. I forget what they what they term them, but these these trees are like the equivalents of the ones that officially feed into the the mainstream one, and they. Is, is there a subtree that uh, an official subtree that deals with assigned boots? No, there isn't, okay. unfortunately. There, there is. <laughs> okay, so uh, okay, good. So they're in the uh, upstream tree. That's in yeah. that's in all the ones from the dank. Like the uh, the Chrome people, Chromebook people did. So they actually have a version of Ubuntu that that signs but understands the ARM architecture, not the Ubuntu kind of thing. Yes, I would I would go look at what the Chromebook people did, and if I were going to do one of the, the the fully signed, trusted. No, there, there's the there's the Chrome for the Intel and the Chrome for the the arm and the, there there was a, a vintage of Chromebooks that did what he's talking about. I'm pretty sure. They're, they're, the next version is not going to use U-Boot in the in this process, but the, there was an error when they were using U-Boot for the arm Chromebooks to do the the trusted signed stuff. Yes. Um, 
doing it from Uvut. Oh, you mean an, instead of doing a, a an upgrade from the Linux? Yeah. Because we're we're using a normal version of you know the the end user version of the software, which may not be optimized for programming updates. So what the U-boot does is it will then, I could have gone into a little more detail, so I'll do that now. So you, the U-boot can tell you to load a special programmer version where you have everything you need in the init RAM FS, and that is where your MTD utils gets installed. It's not necessarily installed in the, the normal I'm just programmed to do the, the uh, this to run this application kind of a a build. Right. You yes, you booted into the special programmer. Yep. going to say 100% because there's hardly ever anything that's 100%. But I'm going to say uh, I have never, I can only remember Red Boot being used once upon a time and I I can't remember the last time I've seen that in a board support. So board support packages pretty much come with U-boot and a kernel as a minimum. Nowadays they're, they're actually usually an open embedded layer So and those if open embedded layers if you're not using, um, okay, I thought of I thought of one. Uh, Minnowboard doesn't by default do U-boot. They do the EFI stuff instead. But if you're not doing the the EFI, then you're probably doing U-boot. Um, people who are just doing their own thing are always free to to run their their own coolest uh, favorite. So I don't think there's any reason why Uboot would literally make those things go extinct. But I think Uboot is going to be the the standard for anybody. You know, well, like the Android kernel. I I wish it weren't the case, but if you've got a new chip. Nowadays, it's probably going to be running an Android kernel if you're in something that could possibly be used for CE purposes. Now, that doesn't mean you can't run other obscure kernels on the same hardware. But that's why I mentioned the SPL. Um, it knows how to do teensy tiny builds. So if you if you can actually build it as a secondary program loader, you can build Uboot really cut down. So it it's all configurable. And in fact, in the, in the new mainstream, the new uh, mainline Uboots, they've gone with the kernel. They've done recently done a switch over to the kernel configuration style where you have the, uh, the the menu config and all. I want to turn this one on, this one off, this one on, off, 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 off. Um, in the old days, you, have, you, uh, you know, that you and I worked with mostly is it was go in and edit the header file, right? And then you had to get familiar with that uh, light bedtime reading of a, of a readme to know what things to put in your header. So, I think they're trying to make it more convenient to be able to turn things off so that you only have the things that your project specifically wants. Uh, so yes, the, one of those talks in the, the Europe ELC that are online, the one by uh, Simon Glass covers the, the device tree stuff way better than I could because he's the one that uh, has uh, been leading the, the effort there. He was the one who... So I, if you're interested in Device Tree, I highly recommend watching his video. 
And they, they have made great progress with it last just in last year. A lot of things are going with the device tree, and that, that will in the future make new ports easier, new U-boot ports. Anyone else? Yes. It would be a you would use a different uh, you wouldn't use the U same U boot that you that the software engineers use during development. Um, I think they called it Falcon or something, but they're they're the essentially what they did is they made it to where the, the secondary program loader mode where you compile it down with just a tiny minimum of stuff, that it was smart enough to be able to load your kernel directly without going through. So you compile in just what you need into the tiny one, and it doesn't know how to do any of this net boot nonsense. It doesn't know how to do memory tests, blah, 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 blah. It just knows, I know how to get the kernel from, say, SD or whatever you've got, and pop it in there and run it. So uh, I think that might actually have been Wolfgang who who did that project. But anyways, you can you can look for U-Boot Falcon. I'm pretty sure that was the, the name. Thanks for coming. I guess it's time to hit the exhibition hall. <laughs> <laughs>